Here at Equipping Godly Women, we are all about helping Christian women be all in in faith and family. And of course, as Christian moms, we know that that doesn't just include our faith. It also means helping our kids be strong in the faith as well. That's why today I am so excited to speak with my good friend, Lee Neenheis, author of the brand new book, Counter Cultural Parenting. In today's interview, we're talking about how to teach your kids good character, how to help them follow Jesus in the day-to-day, -day, and just sharing a ton of practical tips and tricks and strategies that work for us on how we raise our kids to love Jesus. Now, Lee is a parent that I honestly really look up to as a godly mom. Just watching her and how she interacts with her kids as portrayed on social media really makes me want to be a better mom as well. I was so encouraged during today's interview. There are so many practical tips that had me doing a mental checklist in my mind. Am I doing that? Am I doing that? What else can I do? How can I implement this in my life? And I just know that you are going to be doing the same as well. So if you have children and you want to raise them to love the Lord, no matter what is going on in the world around you, if you want to learn more about countercultural parenting, today's episode is one you will not want to miss. All right, Lee, can you start just by telling us a little bit about you, about your background, and why this book topic is so important to you? I am Leaning Heiss. I live in West Michigan. I am a wife um, of Mike. We've been married for 20 years, and I am a mom of four great kids. I have three teenagers and one 10-year-old, which is a whole new phase, Brittany. And... Um, it, it's just a really interesting time parenting in this generation, but I'm a Bible teacher. I love Jesus. He captured my heart when I was 17 years old and um, he's the best thing that ever happened to me. And so getting to share that, share the power of his word, the transformation of our minds, it's, it's my greatest joy. Um, but otherwise I, I, I'm just a girl, you know, who drinks coffee and gets up in the morning and needs glasses and, and that kind of girl. All right, so I'm so excited for your new book coming out, Countercultural Parenting. I read your last book. We've had you on the podcast before. You are the only person so far who has ever been invited to come back a second time. Um, but I'm so excited about this book. So will you just start by telling us also a little bit more about your book, what's in it, what can we expect, all of the things just to kind of start us off? Oh, I love that. Thanks for having me back, by the way. So this one's called Countercultural Parenting. I have a copy right here. Just uh, is coming out June 9th. So that is very exciting. The subtitle is Building Character in a World of Compromise. And so this one is about raising children who live for Jesus. Um, the last one was about living for Jesus no matter what we felt as far as mom fear, like sending them out to do whatever God had called them to do. But what I realized is that that depends on a day-to-day -day walk and growth in our children. And so what I was finding was is that I, I had the big picture in mind, but there were some things that were happening in our home in the day-to-day -day where it felt like our character was beginning to erode a little. And, and so I started asking the question, Lord, what does it look like to raise somebody who will follow Jesus for the long haul and live faithful in the day-to-day? -day? And, um, and that sent me on a pursuit of an understanding of character. Why do we call um, certain things good character and certain things bad character? And why is it so important? Why are there certain things that are universal among us that we understand even though some people don't walk with Jesus or see scripture as a thing that defines character? And so this really has to do with breaking down the question, what is character? And the reason why I feel like it's such a timely book is because we see this great erosion of character in our society right now. We see that, especially when you turn on the news and you see it in politics. Like, we don't have polite politics anymore. It's no holds bar attack. It's, we call it mudslinging. Um, but, but we also see it, it hit the church. It, it hit when Me Too movement began and we realized that women at, at huge levels had been sexually molested and assaulted. So what does that say about our boys, you know? And so I think it was really timely, this, this intersection of what society 
was doing and what what God was doing in this great revelation of poor character and what was happening inside my home, which was that I was beginning to see that um, my kids had character issues too. And when I really started looking at it, those character issues were in me as well. And so countercultural parenting is saying it is completely countercultural to say that our character matters most. After knowing and loving Jesus, God is after our character. Yeah, I've seen that same thing in my house as well. Um, obviously, no family is perfect. No kids, no parents are perfect. But every time that my children do things that drive me crazy or have a bad attitude, and I want to be like, hey, you can't behave that way, I always stop. And I'm like, they learned that from me. Like, that's where they got it from in the first place. And it's so frustrating. Like, of course, I want to parent them and ship with them well. But then also it starts with... I need to start setting a better example and not being grouchy with them when they don't deserve me to be grouchy with them. So can you just tell us a little bit, what are just some practical tips that we can dive in, get really meaty in this conversation? What are some things that we can do to raise our kids to have good character? Well, I think the first step that moms and dads need to take is that we need to do a character assessment. So, Brittany, it's just like sitting down with your kids and saying, this is the age that they're at. This is the stage. And this is what I can expect of them. And so some of that has an understanding of, of that child Um where they are, but we need to take a snapshot of who they are in this moment and figure out where the character erosion is starting. And then we need to look at God and who he is, what he's asked our children to become. And we need to start trying to line up the things that we see in his word that he's asking our children to be like, for example, truthful and honest. And we need to say, is my child right now, you know, you have a child that is, I think, in early elementary school. I do too. So what can we expect of that child right now? So when I know that when my child is six years old, that my child should know the difference between truth and falsehood, right? A lie and the truth. At six years old, I can expect that. And so I need to say, Lord, um, actually, I can't always trust my child to tell me the truth the first time that I ask, or I can, and then we celebrate those things. So we think the first thing that we do is that we start lining up character issues with God's word and figuring out where they are. I think that is where our first step happens. Do you have some kind of guidelines or checklist or something in the book for parents who are like, okay, where do I even start? Because character is such a huge topic and you know, the Bible is full of just lists of commands. How can we figure out what areas our child should be doing that maybe that they're not? I love it that you asked. So yes, um, not only is there a list in the book, we break it down based on what Paul wrote to Timothy. Um, set, don't let anyone look down on you because you're young, but set an example for the believers in speech, life, love, faith, purity. So it's five things, right? And I just, speech, life, love, faith, purity, I turned life into conduct. But when you look at things through that lens, ultimately there's no part of our being that doesn't exist in one of those one of those categories. And actually on um, my website, counterculturalparenting.com or on the characterquiz.com, I have created an assessment for parents to take that will shoot you back areas of character. So it has um, 50 questions assessing your child's character and saying, okay, so here, here's what we have. This is where we think we're off course. And then I have some beginning steps in scripture to help you align it. But I think the question that parents need to really ask, and and the one that I adjust straight off at the top of the book, Brittany, is wh where does character come from? And I just want to tip my hand. And yes, I would love for you to read along with me, but we describe character and we know character because it is found in who God is in his nature, character, and power. So we esteem truthfulness, like we've been talking about, because God is true and there is nothing false in him. We esteem self-sacrifice because God demonstrates that in Jesus. We um, 
esteem generosity because we have a God who is a benevolent and giving God. He's loving. He's kind. In him is light. There's no darkness at all. So he is at, at the core of who he is. He is good character. And what's really fun is that the world esteems these things too, some sometimes, but usually because our hearts are aching towards God. He created us to need him. And so it's really fun to sit, to look at the things that we see in society. And when people feel injustice and, and, and feel, um, slighted it's because god has written this bent towards him on our hearts if people would just reach out and seek him i love that and that's a great reminder too that anytime if we are feeling that injustice or that anger of this thing is wrong that it's just such a good reminder of, for us to okay that's because we are made in god's image and we have this calling to want to be like him so i just love that reminder well and in God in his in the word in, in Romans chapter eight says that he is conforming us into the image of Jesus. That is what he's doing in the middle of every Christ followers life, whether they're six years old or 96 years old. His goal for us is to be conformed into the image of Jesus. And scripture says that Jesus was the perfect image of God. And so he really is our goal is to help our kids look like Jesus. And so when we participate in this, when we do character formation, we're cooperating with what God is actively doing in their lives right now. Okay, so let me ask you, because I know that a lot of people who are listening to this probably have children around the school age, teenage years. But for anybody who's listening who doesn't have children in that age range, what about parents of really small little ones, what age can we start with this kind of countercultural parenting? Is it something that we start thinking about when they're newborns? Is it something that we start thinking about when they're a few years old and they can kind of start to understand? Um, when does it start or how could we get started with this? I am so glad that you asked that question. And I have just started working on something that I, I can't wait to unroll to the world. But I really think there are ages and stages and there are certain things at zero to three, we are modeling character to our kids. Really everything that they're learning in the preschool years comes from the example that we're setting. And God's wired our kids to mimic our behavior. And so they need to learn that there is truth in this stage. They're supposed to learn from us that God loves them and it's appropriate to love in return or be loving. They understand right and wrong, and it's our job to help um, tune their hearts to that. They need to understand authority and living under authority at zero and three. Isn't that so fun? Um, they can learn how to say, I'm sorry. I don't think they learn how to feel that until they're maybe four or five, you know, direct remorse because of sin. But I, I love this, that we can help begin to shape um, love, joy inside of them. We can help them even at zero to three, we begin praying with them when they feel afraid. We can shape their hearts in the area of peace. So character formation does start really little. It just, it depends on us because we're, we're talk, talk, talking about faith. When they shift into four and five years old, they begin to receive our teaching, not just our modeling, but they'll sit for longer. You know this, you've experienced it too. All of a sudden they're willing to pull up their Bible alongside you while you're having your quiet time and we can have small conversations a little bit about what would it be like if you had been sitting on the beach with Jesus and and he um said to Peter cast your net on the other side what would you think would you think that was crazy what would you think if the net was full of fish you know all of a sudden they're able to engage in conversations and so they're able to begin to receive teaching about character formation as well. And then six to 11, this is where our full on training really begins. And I wanna point out something for any listeners who probably are not following you on Instagram, but I do, because there was something that you did, 
I don't know, a few weeks ago. That really caught my attention when you're speaking of how you model things for your children. You had done a Facebook Live where you were walking around outside and you said, look at this stuff like this is so weird it must be um the rapture because here is my children's stuff right here in the middle of the driveway and there's no <laughs> children like this is so weird has it been the rapture and it was just so hilarious just a funny mom moment but then i watched your stories again later and you came back and you were right there with your son both of you together and you were like i have to apologize because it wasn't my son who did this. It was actually my daughter who did this. So I am getting on Instagram Live for the world to apologize that I accused him of this thing. And it was just really cute. And it wasn't like angry. You guys were just sitting there snuggled together on the couch or whatever. But I was like, that is such a great example of modeling what it looks like to be a good Christian for your kids. Because, I mean, it was all silly and all, it was all in fun. But you were not shy to get up and say, not even to your son, but on Instagram to say, okay, this isn't actually what happened. I'm going to apologize. And actually saying those words, just such a great example for your son. And then for me also, just to see, okay, this is what it looks like to parent teenagers. Well, this is a really interesting age to parent teenagers in. You know, most of us are on social media, Brittany, and you are. And if we're going to have our kids on at any level or we're going to be honest about our parenting journey, which, you know, I, I sometimes I just wish like God had called me to do this in 20 years, not right now while I'm in the middle of it. But that's not his call on my life. And so that affects my kids. And um, I when I say something offhanded about one of them, I need to clean it up because they're involved in this. But it does make us think as parents what we're saying about our children on social media and how that affects them. But actually, that's a really great thing. As, I, as the mom of three teenagers now, everything they say matters. And I need to be modeling that for them too. I love that. So, okay, I have to ask you just for my own personal curiosity here. I love looking up to you as a sister who's a few steps ahead. Your kids are teenagers. My oldest is turning 11 here soon. Um, so mine are a little couple of steps behind yours. What advice do you have for people, um, other women who have kids about my age who are getting into the teenage years? What kinds of things do we need to make sure that we do or don't do or watch out for as we're getting closer to those ages? Um, I really think that the question always, Brittany, is does my child know Jesus as Savior? Do I see fruit of that in their life? Okay, so everything stems out of that because you cannot appeal to them at a spiritual level, you know, touch their spirit until that child knows Jesus. Not that you don't fight for it all the time, not that you stop saying the things, but that's the biggest prayer of any mom's heart. After that's accomplished, then I really think that the next question is, is my child teachable? Um, going into the teenage years, they're going to hit a stage where they know more than you do. I, I'm certain. I haven't met a parent who doesn't say that your kids all of a sudden think they're geniuses. Um, my three certainly do. But do they, at the end of the day, really have a teachable heart? Because your job as a parent is to help put things in front of them that talk and shape their ideas about God. And so really, I would say to you, Brittany, fill their life with all different kinds of things that will fascinate them about God and, and, and feed that, feed that liberally. You know, what, what do they engage with? Who do they engage with? And how can I help? them form their faith. After that, I really want to know that my teenagers are trustworthy. I have been after that since day one, but trustworthiness is in my top I, one or two things that I'm going to expect from my child. Lying to me is not acceptable, but that also means that I need to be willing to hear hard things from them, right? Like I need, I need to hear um, I need to be asking questions, but I also need to be able to hear hard things, temptations that they're having, struggles. And, and one of the ways that we show them that we're trustworthy is that when they tell us hard things, we don't flinch and turn away. So right now, Brittany, it's important that you practice your I'm not surprised face. Like, I'm not surprised you're a sinner. Of course you're a sinner. Your mom's a sinner. Your dad's a sinner. You're a sinner. You, of course, you're tempted that way. Or of course you have mean thoughts about your siblings or whatever. I'm just not surprised. I'm like that too. 
Yeah, that's one thing that we've been working on in our house a lot lately too. When our kids do something wrong, really making a distinction between what they did wrong and what they need to learn. And having that conversation to say, it's okay that you did something wrong. Everybody does something wrong. But the important thing is that you learn your lesson so that next time, and my kids have got to be so tired of hearing me talk about learn your lesson. And I don't say it in a mean way, but you have to learn the lesson so that next time you can make a better choice. Like you're going to make mistakes. Okay. What did we learn out of this? And every time if they get sent to their room and I go up there to talk to them, they know as soon as I open the door, the first thing I'm going to say is what did you did? What did you do? Because I want them to admit it to me so that they can be honest. What did you do? And secondly is what are you going to do next time? So that they know what they're doing. They are not just, oh, I'm going to sit in my room for a minute and then we're going to move on with our life. But okay, what did you do? What lesson did you learn? How can we do this differently? You're not a bad person because you did something wrong, but I want you to learn and use this as a learning experience. So next time it's different. Yeah, you're human because you did something wrong, right? Like if we don't teach them that, that, that they're human, they're going to make mistakes, but we have a God and he is a forgiver, but he's also a reconciler. Sin always costs something. And we put that on Jesus. If we trust in Jesus, then we, I mean, first John one nine says, if we confess our sins, he is faithful and just will forgive us our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. But we need to teach our kids just like you're doing. They need to confess their sins. They need to ask forgiveness and they need to make a plan to not do it again. That's just good parenting, Brittany. While we're, while we're thinking about this, one of the things that I've learned to do as well is to help my kids figure out what the impact of their behavior was on someone else. So that's to empathize or sympathize with the pain that that behavior caused. So I'm asking them when they've called me, when they forgot to call me and let me know that their sports bus was coming in late and I've been waiting in the parking lot for 45 minutes, not only do they jump in and say, sorry, mom, not only do they say next time I'm going to text you earlier, but they're also going to say, mom, I know you've been sitting here in the parking lot and waiting for me and that was probably really frustrating and you had other things to do. I'm sorry because it impacted somebody else. That's the kind of apology that I want, that I crave. And so we're also just teaching our kids to give the kind of apology that that esteems the other person um and and who they are as well i love that another thing that i was going to mention that i do just to throw it out there for any readers who listeners who would also find it helpful is when i tell my kids to do something i try to really not just tell them do this because mom says so, but really equip them to make good decisions on their own. So don't just listen to mom because mom's the boss, but okay, what is the right decision to make in this? Because I don't want my kids, and I'm sure that this flies in the face of what a lot of parents do, but I don't want my kids to grow up listening to me. I want my kids to learn from me how to make good decisions on their own. Can you speak to that a little bit as well? I think that's really good too. I, I We want our kids to have an active relationship with the father and to be motivated by him, not just motivated by our pleasure or displeasure. That means that they're behaving to please us and not to please God, which ultimately, and I think I talked about this in Brave Moms, Brave Kids extensively, but there are times when what I want for my children is not going to line up what, with what God wants for them. And when those things fly into conflict, and they will, even with really good moms, I want them to listen to the Heavenly Father. I want them to know what His voice sounds like and to be motivated by Him, um, live for His glory, for His pleasure. So ultimately, the thing that... Um, I want my kids to discover is that they are doing these things not just so that they don't drive their mom crazy, not just so that they don't get in trouble, though surely that's good stuff, but because this is the character that God esteems and values. This is what makes them more Christ-like. And 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 ultimately this is what's good for them. This is the the path that leads to blessing. The path of the righteous um grows brighter as as day progresses. That's what 
Proverbs says, or the path of the righteous is blessed, you know? So we want God's blessing for them. And that's why they're doing these things, not just to please us. Okay, so I talk a ton about helping moms to get in the word and help us to, as moms, be more Christ-like, be more godly women. But can you share with us just some really practical tips of how do we help our kids do that? Because most of our kids aren't going to be on Christian websites on their own, like going on Pinterest and Googling, like how to read the Bible more. Um, our kids don't naturally do that. So what kinds of things do you do or can moms do to really develop their spirit? spiritual life with their kids. Mm, so good. So uh, like Brittany, I don't know about you, but I um, love to get new resources, but we just work together as a family through scripture first, especially when they're little. So age appropriate Bibles. I don't know how oh, everybody feels about that. But for me, I wanted a preschool Bible. I wanted a toddler Bible. And yes, at the earliest ages, those are, those are written age appropriately. Soon after probably like about seven years old, six, seven years old, I get them a copy of the NIRV, which is the New International Reader version. I found that that is the version that that my kids, it sounds like their heart language at that age. And so that's when I start saying, you know what, why don't we just sit down and buy a devotional? But I want a devotional that points them to studying the word that's going to say, mark these words or to ask questions. And so I'm, I'm looking for devotionals all the time that do that, that get my kids into the word, not just chew the word up and then feed it to them. I want the ones that are going to put them in the word. And so I've, I've done that for a long time, bought books that supplement like that. But now my daughter Lexi just started reading the book of Philippians on her own. And, and sometimes she has questions about that. So I'm just engaging her, trying to engage her in what are you reading? What are you learning? What are you thinking about today? How does this apply to your day? Um, but we do this through modeling, right? A mom fascinated by the word is the greatest catalyst for growth inside of her children when her children are at home. So especially as we're transitioning from this end of the school year into the summer, I'm already starting to think also, what am I going to do with my family this summer to keep the kids busy? Because I do work during the day while they're home. Um, I want them to have time, like I want them to have things to do. Um, I am a mean mom who makes my kids do homework during the summer because it's good for them no. and it's good for me. And so I'm just, <laughs> oh, I totally am. Um, I, my, degree is in elementary education. So I kind of can't help it. I'm like, here's some worksheets and go learn some stuff because you need to continue to be smart. Um, yes. So I do that, but I'm thinking, okay, as we are going into the summer here, what do I need to do? And I'm thinking, and I can't promise I'm going to follow through with all of these things perfectly, but I need to like have some kind of weekly memory verse where all three of the kids can work on the verse and when we have lunch together, we can like practice it. And it doesn't have to be this whole huge thing, but just be like, here's your verse. If you remember it by the end of the week, then we'll bake cookies or something. Because I remember when I was little, I was in Bible quizzing and I was in Awana and I was in all of these things where I had those weekly memory verses every week. And I still, as an adult, when I'm in situations, when I'm just going through my day, God will absolutely drop verses right into my head and remind me of these verses that I learned as a little kid that I don't know. I mean, obviously God can do anything, but having those verses already in my head, it makes it that much easier for God to be like, remember this verse that you know, remember this verse, and it helps me to stay on the right track. So teaching those to my kids, there is... We've been watching, we watched through all of the What's in the Bible series, which is by um, Phil Vischer. I'm not sure how to say his name, but the creator of Veggie Tales. But it walks kids through. We did that all last summer of it walks through. Here's what's in Genesis and here's what's in Exodus and every book all the way through. And that was so good. And my kids loved it. Um, the oldest one obviously got the most out of it. The littlest one probably had no idea what was going on, but still I'm sure enjoyed. It's just silly. Um, but so that they're getting in the word that way. And um, have you seen The Chosen that has been advertised lately? Oh my goodness. Yes, I have. Have you? I have only watched the first couple of them and I'm trying to decide like, do I show these to my children? Because they're not really made, like they're not bad, but they're not made for little ones. Episode three. Episode three. Brittany, you have to go watch it. Okay. Jesus is with the children in that episode. 
that's the one that I ended on. I got through three. So I'm like, yes, I know that one would be really good, but I don't know like all the rest of them, especially once I get to like the passion. If I want to show that to my littlest ones. I think we're a long way from the passion coming out. Okay. But episode okay. number four, Jesus is with the disciples in the boat. And I, I am telling you, my son Ryan is 10. So take this for what it's, take it for what it's worth. But he was like, Jesus is so cool. I mean, he has pulled us onto the couches to watch The Chosen. I could rewatch them again today with him. He is so fascinated. And you know what? I just like, I said to him after finishing, I said to the Lord after I finished the series, you are so much better than I thought you were. Like, I, I love you even more now because I watched that. And I've given my whole life, my whole career to studying Jesus. But to see another portrayal of the stories that I know to be true, it has ignited my heart in a new way. And I think that that's just what we're trying to do all the time is hold up another lens to our kids about the greatness of God. So last night at the dinner table, I had um, a couple of our next door neighbors. We live at a Christian camp and conference center, which you know. So we just live in a, a, a community. I mean, it's almost compound, you know. We just, um, these families that serve together all the time. So I had five teenagers at the table last night, and I pulled out the Jesus Storybook Bible Um and I said, you guys, I just, I want to read you something today because we just found out hard news. Like none of them are going to have summer jobs this summer because um, of what's going on in our community right now um, with COVID-19. And and they're all so sad at, at a level. They're worried about college, that kind of thing. And I pulled out the Jesus Storybook Bible and I went to Matthew chapter five where Matthew's or where Jesus is saying, do not be anxious. Consider the birds. Consider the, the flowers in the field. And what I loved about the, just taking back to the Jesus Storybook Bible is that it's take something that they know now that they could almost recite to me, just like you said, because we, they've memorized it since they were little. And it just puts that fresh lens over their eyes where God talks to them in another way, you know. And I think sometimes all of us want to be talked to like we're we're like we're children not like talk down to us but speak to us in love there's something about the way that we talk to our kids when they're little that's just so much more tender than when we talk to them when they're teenagers and um gosh even saying that out loud challenges me to talk to them in a different way you know and and I need Jesus to talk to me in that tender way, to lead me in that tender way, which is just such a challenge to me as a mom to speak the same words of comfort to them and to help them see God's word as comforting, not just a chore checklist, but something that that we draw strength from. Yeah, and it's so important to remember that as much as we think of ourselves as parents, as the ones who are teaching our children and handing on the things down to them that our children can have a relationship with God as well, that we are absolutely called to provide them things, but God can speak to them directly as well. And they are people with their own spirit and their own relationship with God and just doing anything that we can to foster that as well. We are almost out of time. I literally Lee, could just sit here and talk to you all day long and I would if I could, but I won't keep our listeners hostage forever. So before we wrap up for the day, do you have just any parting words of advice, anything you really want to make sure that you share or didn't have a chance to say? I would love to actually. I start countercultural parenting with a story about catching my son looking at pornography. And he has given me permission to share that story. It took a lot for us to do that. Um, but the reason why I do is because, honestly, I don't think there's anything else that we could do that we're not doing to try to point our kids to Jesus. Sure, there's little things during the day here and there. But at the end of, end of all of this, our, our kids are free agents and they choose God on their own. And our identity as parents cannot be wrapped up in our children. That's not healthy. We need to be able to stand for the Lord and say, Lord, as far as it depended on me, I tried to point that child to you. But we need to understand that our kids are going to fall into their own pits. You did, Brittany. I did. We all do. 
And, and what happened out of that time of finding my son in there is that we found that he experienced a grace in the Heavenly Father that he would not have found if he had lived this perfect storybook dream childhood. He loves the Heavenly Father in a way that is new and refreshing. He is obeying him in a new way, walking out of that. When he shares his testimony, and boy does he now, in ways he did not before, he knows a brokenness, but he knows the grace of God in a deeper way. And not only that, but our, our story is shaped by the walking through that together and is closer in a way that I don't think we would have experienced if we hadn't gone through that. And so as our, our friends and our listeners are, are leaning into this, I want to close up like this. Like we're not going to get it all right. As much and as hard as we, as we try, it's just not going to turn out always the way we think it is. But we can trust God for the grace to walk through their character mess ups and ours. Um, that he is going, he is always working for the good of those who love him. And surely that is us as moms who are leaning in and going, God, what do we do here? We need to trust even when our kids seem off track, even when this whole thing feels like it's going wrong, he is working for our good and our God is good and faithful. Lee, you are so full of encouragement today. And as we talked before the recording and as we've talked on the recording, I literally am over here in my head making checklists like, am I doing this thing? Am I doing this thing? How are we doing here? And I'm sure that I'm going to continue doing that all day, trying to think, okay, what do I need to work on? How am I doing? Not that it's up to me because it is absolutely not. It is up to God, but that I know that I am doing the best that I can with what I have with my children and just trusting God that he is taking care of everything um, and he makes up for anything that we lack on the other end. So Lee, by the time that this episode comes out, your book, new book, Countercultural Parenting will have just launched into, into the world. And I'm sure that our listeners are going to want to check it out. Can you tell us a little bit more? I know you told us a little bit about this assessment, so I'm going to remind people because that sounds amazing and I need to make sure that I go do that. But tell us a little bit more about where's the best place to find the book, find the assessment, so we don't forget. You can get the book wherever books are sold. It's counter Countercultural Parenting. And I'm leaning high Brittany will have all of that in the show notes. But if you go to counterculturalparenting.com, you can find more resources that go with the book and you can find the quiz there or you can go directly to the quiz at thecharacterquiz.com. And that'll just start not only the character assessment quiz, but five days worth of emails and videos from me walking through what do we do now that we have found these results? Because like you said earlier, Brittany, we just need to know what to do about it after we find it. And it helps kind of sort through what does scripture say when we find a character issue, what do we do? And so I would love to be an encouragement in any way. But Brittany, I just have to say before we get off this line that I am so proud of you and the way that you're running after Jesus and any friend of yours is a friend of mine. Oh, you're going to make me cry again. This will be the third time today. Um, we have had great conversations. Okay. So thank you, Lee, so much for coming on the podcast today and sharing so much encouragement and so much wisdom that we as moms need. Oh, you're a good friend, Brittany. All right. So that just about does it for today's episode today. Personally, I found this conversation to be so encouraging and I cannot wait to put some of the things that we talked about today into practice in my own family, starting with going and taking Lee's assessment to see how my kids are doing on character, what my first steps might be going forward to put more of this into practice. So I'm going to leave the link in the show notes down below this video so that you can go take the assessment. Also a link to where you can find Lee's book, Countercultural Parenting, that just came out that um, you are definitely going to want to read. So I highly encourage you to take the assessment, go get the book. I'll leave a link to her website as well. Um, check all of these things out. They're going to be so helpful and encouraging for you as a Christian mom. And then last but not least, as always, if you have not subscribed yet to the Equipping Godly Women podcast, what are you waiting for? We come back all the time to share practical, encouraging interviews with people you will want to hear from. So go ahead and subscribe if you have not already. And I will talk to you again real soon. All right. Bye.